Welcome to a special edition of the Mad Bros Media Zoom Show and Podcast. On this episode, we are paying tribute to the legendary Richard Donner, who passed away at age 91 on July 5th. He will be deeply missed, but forever remembered for his films such as Superman, The Omen, Lady Hawk, The Goonies, Scrooged, and the Lethal Weapon series. While many actors are paying tribute to Donner, we were fortunate to chat with actor Damien Hines, who is in all four Lethal Weapon films and Scrooged. The first thing we asked Damon was when the last time he chatted with the director. Probably face-to-face, maybe 15 years or more uh, ago. Um, uh, one of our uh, more um, memorable conversations from that time was when uh, I was getting married. Uh, I spoke to him about two days before uh, the wedding date and just asked him for any advice. I knew he had had a successful marriage. Mm. Uh, and in his uh, true, you know, kind of larger than life way, he said, just get in there, kick ass, do it every day and good things will happen. And he's been right going on 20 years of marriage. Um, so those words uh, that he offered were taken to heart. Yeah. Did he have uh, a lot of advice to you throughout the years? He did, you know, especially when I was younger, when we were on the set, uh, Ebony Smith, uh, who plays the younger sister, um, uh, Carrie Murtaugh, uh, and I got to spend a lot of time together. Uh, just the nature of how a production uh, takes place with uh, uh, youth talent. Um, and in our down times, we were, you know, Dick had an open set where we could like literally go sit next to him during takes. And so he talked to me quite a bit about, you know, just life and um, production, uh, but more importantly, the importance of school. I'm happy to say Ebony Smith is also uh, a doctor as well. Um, she's a medical doctor. And I actually teach at Loyola Marymount University uh, mm-hmm. as well. And so um, we've done well, but yeah, he always um, was open to uh, sharing his perspective Um, on a number of things. And uh, I was old enough uh, to kind of have it lock in and and not take it for granted. Yeah. I I heard too that he gave all all the children uh, college grants, right? Or not college grants, but he paid for you guys' college? Well, certainly for me, yeah. He he was uh, instrumental in paying for the final year Uh of my undergraduate degree at uh, Loyola Marymount, which obviously, again, is... Um, wonderful, but it was uh, Dick and Mel both uh, paid for uh, that full year. And, you know, back then um, it wasn't the tuition that it is today, but it was still a significant number. Oh, yeah. So did they come to your graduation? <laughs> no, no, they did not. Uh, that would have been nice, but uh, very busy men, of course. Wow. What about your lectures? Did they ever come to your, any of your lectures when you were teaching? No, especially at Loyola, they would have shut that down just because of privacy issues um, and concerns with students. Maybe I'm not, they could slip in with like a coat or glasses. <laughs> no. So tell us about your uh, audition for Lethal Weapon. How old were you when you when you auditioned for Lethal Weapon? I want to say I was around 10 or 11. I had just completed touring uh, on the national uh, ensemble of Tap Dance Kid. And so I did that for about a year and a half. And I get this call, you know, and I'm young. So my mom says, hey, we have an audition. Great. Um, get my sides. And my mom was kind of my, my, my practice partner. So we go through our routine, which is typically, you know, going over the sides three or four times, having some fun. She did a really good job of making sure that um, I didn't get overwhelmed with, you know, the moment or the pressures that come with performing uh, in Hollywood at an elite level. Um, and so I show up to Warner Brothers. Uh, his office was, you know, on, this, on the uh, lot at the time and I get called in. And I did not know, you know, going into the audition that Mel, Danny, and Dick, and Joe Silver would all be there. So I was just assuming I was going to be reading with the casting director as a 10-year-old. You know, you're still somewhat aware of, you know, the process. I'm like, okay, I'll be, you know, auditioning with uh, the casting director. But no, I walk in, there's Mel, there's Danny, there's Dick, and there's Joe. And I knew who uh, Joel, and I knew who they all were. And so as soon as I walk in, um, for some reason, Danny starts the lines. Danny Glover starts reading the lines. And I'm kind of still somewhat acclimating to the room. And it was this awkward pause because I didn't, you know, obviously deliver my lines. And so my response was, did I, did I miss something? And Dick lets out this booming laugh. 
ha, 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 stands up, puts his arm around me and starts walking me to the, jo- to the door. Great job, kid. Great job, kid. And I'm out. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> you know, and so I go over to my mom and I'm like, hey, you know, in my 10-year-old vernacular, I think I kind of messed up and I, you know, this audition. No worries, son, what happened? I explained to her kind of what happened. And she's like, you didn't even say your lines. I'm like, no, I didn't get them out. Um, it just said, you know, good job. So I think her understanding what we thought was going to be the outcome, which is you didn't get this. Um, she takes me to get ice cream. I remember that very vividly. Uh, and, I, and I don't think anything about it until about 24 hours later. And I'm like, oh, you booked it. And I'm like, there's no callback. You, you booked it. And so whatever my reaction was, um, Dick appreciated. I know he was very big in having authentic moments um, as part of his, um, you know, filmmaking. And so maybe that's what, you know, it's the smallest of things that can be the difference between landing a role and not landing it. So uh, God was just on my side that day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, he, he, you made him laugh. I think that's what got him. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Right. So when I was, I was watching uh, bits and pieces of Lethal Weapon last night, and I came across the uh, the dinner table scene where you start beatboxing. Was that oh, was that was that your idea or was that in the script? It was not in the script. Uh, um, and I don't remember it. You know, I remember hip hop, while still you know kind of you know uh, a national uh, art form, was still relatively young. So we're talking about like eighty four, maybe. You know, so it had kind of just you know, emerged nationally. In New York, it was obviously, you know, full-blown, um, you know, really deep culture. Um, and I don't remember if Ebony and I were sitting around playing or if I was listening to uh, rap music, probably some L, L- Cool J or somebody like that. And I know he heard it. Um, and he goes, can you do that again? And I'm like, yeah. So this is like obviously off, uh, the camera's not rolling. And I, you know, started what we call freestyling, just mm-hmm. making up, you know, lyrics and um, the Fat Boys. I don't know if you guys remember the Fat Oh, boys. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Fat Boys, the human beatbox was obviously, you know, pretty big. And that was one of the guys I really liked. So I was, you know, doing the, the beats and Ebony was trying to freestyle. I'm trying to freestyle. And the next thing we you know, he says, okay, sit down. This is what we're going to do. And action. And we, Ebony and I start, you know, flowing and doing the beatbox and Next thing I look up, it's in the movie. Because, you you know, yeah. again, you never know what's going to make it and what's not going to make it. But obviously, it became one of the more iconic aspects of um, the franchise. Now, what, one thing that stands out, that beatbox, that you, you were slapping your... <laughs> I said, I hadn't seen that part in a beatbox before. That was something like original that I hadn't seen. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you really want to see it done right, you got to pull up some of the yeah. old boy stuff. It pushed, pushed me to shame. So no, That's to- one of the funniest scenes in the movie. <laughs> right. Then you try to get you try to get Danny Glover to do it. <laughs> right. It was it was and it was really us, you know, having a moment and playing around and mm. kind of enjoying ourselves and you know just how unbelievably tolerant you mm. know the adults were. You know, these are these are professional actors, right? That are that are well into their twenties or thirties and and still able to um, get down and and have fun with two children who were yeah. true children at the time. So, yeah, it was a special moment. Was it, was, uh, was there sequels planned like earlier on or at least, at least a sequel to part one? Cause I think sometimes it's hard to like capture the same magic in a, in a sequel, but I thought like, well, you know, leave the weapon two was very, very like it, it still embodied, you know, this still capture the magic of part one. And then you guys still, I mean, with, with throughout the whole franchise, like you guys as a family had really good chemistry. So it was, I'm glad that they had you come back, all those same people every time. So never had a clue um, that a sequel was coming down the pipeline. You know, if, if Lethal Weapon was made today, they probably would have locked us all into, you know, long-term contracts and things of that nature. Um, so it was really almost per um, film. And being, you know, children in the family, we were probably the last ones to know when it was coming down the pipeline. Um, but I do know, you know, from talking to my mom over the years um, in her conversations with my agent at the time, uh, it was really Dick who was adamant that the family remained the same. 
if you look at movies like um, National Lampoons, you know, they can interchange kids whenever they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and they certainly could have done it because it was so successful. So, so successful. There would have been tons of, you know, kids loving to line up and, you know, play my role or play Ebony's or Tracy Wolf, who was the older sister at the time. Um, but Dick was really adamant about keeping that continuity. And I think it helped. You know, I think it helped that. Um, when we did return to film, it was like, hey, how have you been? Oh, you're taller. It was really like um, people that you've uh, known and for them watching me and Ebony grow up literally in front of them. Um, I think when I said the first one I filmed was maybe 10 or 11. The last uh, uh, Little Weapon 4 I filmed, I was probably 22, 23, graduating from college. So it spanned, you know, uh, a, a significant portion of my, you know, uh, childhood, adolescence into uh, early adulthood. And you know what's really, really good too about the sequels? Weapon Three uh, it involved like a really big piece uh, of your character, right? Uh, you know, one of the to to your point, one of the nicer comments uh, that I will probably never forget from Dick is we were doing the shaving scene. Uh, Danny and I are doing the yeah. shaving. Um, and again, you remember, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a student, I'm probably maybe 10th, 11th grade at the time, you know, and so, uh, you know, you have these kind of swaths of where, hey, I'm in Hollywood, and then, hey, I'm a regular student being teased by my, you know, classmates. I'm like, hey, I'm back doing the weapon too, and then I'm, then I'm the student. Um, but, you know, limited, you know, work as far as kind of really being on camera, kind of unpacking some of the, you know, heavier aspects, what all actors want to do, which is, you know, scenes. Um, so I get the script and I'm like, oh, wow, I have a really good scene with Danny. Mm-hmm. I hope it makes it. Um, but we, you know, they set up the lighting, we go in and we shoot. Um, and I remember it being really, really, it was eerie because it was super quiet and it's usually a very lively environment when you're working with Dick. Um, and after we shot the final take, um, he walked up to me and he goes, I didn't know you could act that. Wow. Well done. And then he, you know, kind of walks up and we're on to the next, you know, scene. But it just really was like, wow, you know, to have him value my work and then to be able to stand up there with someone like Danny Glover, who is immensely talented. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, all the world to me. And so I will always remember that kind of look in his face. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mom, guess what he said? Guess what he told me, you know? Um, and it was really, you know, it, it was never a father you know, son relationship by any stretch of the means, but you want to please him. He makes you want to turn in the best of you, um, uh, not necessarily for him, for yourself, right? Um, But in doing that, you feel like you're pleasing someone. And it was just, you know, an awesome moment to know that I'd done something that, you know, uh, brought him happiness and pride. And those are the best, best little memories to remember. Oh, yeah. Especially when, when, like, like Donner says that to you, because, it's like, it's the world, you know? Correct. You know, yeah. and, and at that point, you're very aware of, you know, at 10, I kind of knew who they were. Oh, that's, you know, those are some guys that act, you know, and got it. Yeah. But by 15, you're like, oh, oh, I know exactly who, <laughs> this is Danny, this is Mel, this is Dick, mm-hmm. you know, I got, this is Joe Pesci. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was incredibly blessed to kind of have it at a time where I understood, like, wow, this is, you know, this is not, this doesn't happen every day, you know, um, especially as a black actor, to be quite honest, you know, and at that time, we just weren't working that way, you know, and so I never took it for granted uh, when I showed up to set. I wanted to make sure, um, even as young as I was, that I was a professional, I knew what the hell I was doing, um, and it wasn't going to be me while the scene didn't work, you know what I'm saying? It was not going to be me, yeah. and, um, and so, you know, to, again, to have that validation from him was just amazing. Yeah, I, I know that uh, Mel was famous for pranking. Did he do any pranks to you guys? He didn't do any to us, but, you know, he would do funny stuff like um, if we had a scene and we're kind of positioned this way and, you know, maybe he's, you know, on the side of us, um, he may show up with like a red nose or something like that. Um, if he was, you know, standing to give you an eye line, um, you know, he may be making faces at you, you know, to try to keep you, you know, loose. Um, and so, yeah, he was, you know, great. Uh, Dick was great. Um, and, you know, it was an environment where it was, you know, not only allowed, but appreciated. You know, there are sets where um, the level of work is, is, is so taxing that you don't have time for all of that, right? Um, 
but certainly in that environment, it worked. Um, and, you know, he had people who appreciated his humor. I certainly did and still do. Um, it just made it again for just, you know, one of the best acting experiences anyone could have. Now, you also worked with, with uh, Richard on um, Scrooge. How was that compared to working on the Lethal Weapon series? So Bill Murray, uh, you know, obviously was the lead for that. A um, little more serious, uh, but I thought Bill was fantastic. Bill, again, was very gracious, uh, very kind. I also worked with Afrey Woodard, who's probably in my top, you know, 10 of actors, period. Um, and so um, to have both of them um, as artists to work off of uh, and Richard orchestrating all of us, you know, uh, was amazing. Um, uh, the audition, I think it was at Paramount, another great fun audition. I walk in and again, I didn't know you because you're, you're a kid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I walk in, I'm like, oh, hey. And he was like, what's going on? You know, just totally going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I did read for that one. So I read the lines. He was like, good job. Get out of here. You know, he's always playing. <laughs> get the hell out of here. So I get out. And it, luckily, you know, um, I'm blessed I book it. Um, and uh, what was interesting is uh, one of the other children and I went to high school together. So we both booked it. So that was kind of unique um, in that it's the sister of um, John and Blake. Uh, Regina King, Regina King's sister and I were in high school together. Um, so we both book it and, you know, it was just and from that point on, hey, let's have a good time. And we did, you know, we really did. Yeah. And it, it seems like the, the, the Lethal Weapon family is pretty tight. Yeah. Are they, um, do you still keep in touch with any of the, of the uh, members, like the family? Not, not so much Mel or da Danny or. Right. But the, well, the the sisters, do you keep in right, touch so with them? Correct. I communicate, you know, still with uh, Tracy and Ebony. Uh -huh. um, we obviously don't talk um, as often as we could because we're mm. grown, have families. Um, um, haven't talked to Darlene in a while. But another strange, you know, um, uh, turn of events is her son and I are in the same fraternity. And oh. so through him, you know, I'm able to keep up with how she's doing. Um, she's obviously unbelievably, she's like a real mom. She's like just unbelievably wonderful. Her kids are wonderful. Uh, are wonderful. Um, and so, yeah, we've all done well. We've all, you know, been able to, you know, um, be proud of, you know, each other's work moving forward. Um, and so hopefully if we do a five, we'll be right back there hugging and, and laughing and having a good old time. Did she do, did she do any singing on the set? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But just, you know, she really embodied that strong mother um, that, you know, I think resonated with, you know, um, most people who watch the films. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very authentic. Uh, you felt that way when you were filming with her. Um, very kind. Very kind. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a, a movie of Richard Donner that was your favorite, aside from working on Lethal Weapon and Scrooge? So, so there are there are so many. So obviously, you know, I, can you lean back a little bit? Patrick, sure. Is that a Superman? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, so so that's certainly, <laughs> and I tease my boys. I have a uh, so I've been married 20, 20 years. Um, I have a nineteen year old, uh, a seventeen year old, and a fifteen year old. Mm -hmm. uh, two so two years apart. But I tease them all the time that I am the real Superman. Mm -hmm. And when they look at my gut, I just tell them that's just part of my costume. You don't see me when I go out and transform to fight crime. Um, and so I tell them we're all Kryptonian. You just, your powers just haven't manifested yet. Um, but certainly we are the last of Krypton's best. Um, but Superman would be high, high, high at the top. Um, I'm a huge fan of Lost Boys. Yeah. I really, really am. And so that might be my sneaky number one. Um, even though I feel some way about it because I'm such a huge Superman. I mean, I am a huge uh, Superman fan. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would, you know, if you, if you ask me tomorrow, I'm probably gonna say Superman and Lost Boys, uh, but certainly Lost Boys was f fantastic. Fantastic, you know, mm -hmm. and it still holds up. You know, you can watch it now and it still is a kick-ass vampire movie, you know? Oh yeah. you know. It's it's they said it's actually one of the best. I mean, I love Lost Boys, but 
but I book. saw Fright Night first, so that's why I always <laughs> say, yeah, Fright Night to me is like, it's, oh, they're kind of almost, you know, they're like way up and down, but right. I would, I would kind of say, you know, for me, Fright Night, but I do love Lost Boys as well. Right. Fright Night is great. How would you feel about Fright Night? Oh, I, I thought Fright Night was a great film. Yeah. I, I loved them, and so... Also, we've had half, like literally most of the cast on. That's why. <laughs> ah, got you. We've but yet to get. Cor- we've yet There's to get no frog. frog. We've yet to get the frog brothers. Yeah. No so, conflict but, of interest with me because I love the film. Yeah. So, yep, I loved it. Did you have uh, any little, any little other anecdotes about Donner on the set of Scrooge or the Lethal Weapon franchise? Um, you know, like I said, uh, what most people have spoken to is his voice, um, um, his presence, right? Um, but I would also add to that, anecdotally, his size. He was a big dude. <clears throat> so imagine a 10-year-old. I don't know how tall the dude was, um, but he seemed like he was seven foot tall, you know, to a 10-year-old. Uh, and that aura and presence, it still seemed that way when I was 23, 24, working with him like, Hey, this is Dick. You don't, you know, mess around. You come prepared. Um, and if you do those things, it'll be successful. Um, but yeah, I've heard him, you know, get after some people on the set before that weren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and I'll just, you know, leave it there. What happens in, you know, on the team stays with the team. Um, but he was a big dude. He was a big dude, you know. And so I don't know, you know, if he played sports or anything, but you know, I could imagine him in past. That would have been an impressive dude running at you. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't gonna. You know, he's gonna hit you. He's a big dude. And then, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, his brother played the sergeant, right? He did. Actually, you know what I found? I, I always thought it was his brother. It's not his brother. It's his cousin. Oh, it's his oh. cousin. Yeah, oh, okay. I looked that up. To I looked that up yesterday. Say, okay. oh, it's his cousin. Well, I know it's a relative because it looks kind of like him. Looks just like him a lot. Yeah, I thought it was his. I've been thinking all these years it was his brother. It's, yeah, I read it was his cousin. Okay, but yeah, yeah that was him. You know, he yeah. um he was going to make sure, and, and like he reminds me of kind of like a, a, a Ron Howard. You know, I think Ron Howard employs his brother. Yeah, quite often Clint all the time, and like he has him in the, well, at least one little scene in every movie. Correct, and I like that. You yeah. know, because you know. That just speaks to Dick sharing his success uh, with those, you know, close to him. Um, and so, again, another consummate professional. Um, he was great to work with. I don't think we had him scenes, but I definitely, you know, met him more times than not if it was through fittings or something like that. Um, but, you know, both of them, uh, great guys, booming voices. Um, are you sure it's not his brother? I thought it was his brother. If it is, the, the, the internet's lying because I said it was yeah. his cousin. So sometimes it could be, you know, it could be yeah. like off, but yeah, yeah. right. Um, but they, but they yeah. sure do look alike. Yeah, a, a great person. Um, yeah. Yep. Other anecdotal kind of stories. Uh, I remember when Joe Pesci got his Oscar, which was awesome. Uh, Joe to me was just amazing to watch, and amazing to watch. Dick direct him because he really wasn't the micromanager. You know, he really didn't get in there and, and you know, try to tell you, you know, what to do. Um, but to see, um, you know, the freedom that Joe had to create this character, Leo gets, you know, in person um, and to see how each take could be radically different. Um, you know, I told him when I, you know, last time we worked together, man, you do, you're like my favorite actor, dude. He was, he's just amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you remember those things as well, and, you know, and Danny, and Danny's another big boy. Danny's a, Danny's a, it's a tall dude. <laughs> so, yeah, those are things that I, you know, remember and will always, you know, kind of keep, you know, locked in. Yeah, you know, what stands out, on, especially in the series, is the, the drive-through and then the... Uh, McDonald's. Yeah, the, oh, it, was a, it was a subway. Oh, it was a subway? Subway, yeah. yeah. But if he didn't want tuna, the- they stuck, he said, I'm, I definitely don't want him to be stuck with tuna. And then the uh, cell phone sequence with him and Chris Rock when they're inside the uh, police oh, station. Yeah. Oh, great. I was going to say that uh, a minute ago you you slipped it by us. You said that you you said he had fun working on one through four and possibly five. I mean, there's been you know over the years there's been murmurings, and then uh, you know like the last thing I think I might have read that everyone was before Donner died. Everyone was on board. Um, the leads. Um, 
So you hear anything? And um, you think now that Don are passed that maybe like Mel could take the seat, the directing seat? I think it would be fitting. Um, you know, I don't know, um, you know, much of, uh, of anything right now, to be quite honest, because it's, you know, so, um, you know, early in the game, at least for us on the, on the talent side of things. Um, but it would be fitting. Um, I think he would do an amazing job. You know, I think his, you know, um, catalog of films demonstrates that. Uh, I think obviously yeah. being um, um, the other half of the dynamic duo, <clears throat> you know, he would have unique insights to what made, um, you know, Danny and him work um, and what made the films work. Um, and so it'd be incredibly fitting. It seems like every year, um, I hear there's a five or, you know, I hear, you know, okay, well, they're going to be a five. There's going to be a new family. Um, or, you know, this person is playing Nick now, or this person is playing Carrie. Um, I have no, you know, idea, unfortunately, obviously it would be very special to have the entire family back. We are all still here, which is another, you know, blessing that the entire family is alive and well. Um, and so I think, you know, audiences obviously would be very, you know, invested in having that continuity remain and then also seeing how we've matured and grown, you know, to see a grown Damon Hines, to see, you know, a grown Ebony Smith, to see a grown, you know, Tracy Wolf, uh, and then to see Darlene Love um, would be, you know, uh, um, you know, um, not only amazing, it would be fitting, but those are the decisions that kind of happen, you know, above our heads and we kind of sit around and hope and pray that, you know, it cuts our way, but we shall see. What is interesting about the the finale of four is they all took that picture and they're like, we're family, which would be a, be a great opening because you would see Mel probably and his son or daughter and Danny and, and Darlene are like great, great grandkids because you have kids. Right. And, uh, and your sister has had kids and then Leo might have a kid. Right. It would have been kind of cool to see that as like an opening. Yeah. How the back family family family. Family. It would just continue right on. And, and like maybe Mel's son is growing up and he's a cop. Right. So, you know, that's been, you know, my barber always says, we got to make you a cop. D, you know, you need to be a cop. And then, and then and Mel has a, has a son who's a cop. And then you guys, are of course, I love it. Uh, who wouldn't want to do that? Right. Who wouldn't want to, you know, oh, yeah. carry the torch for Danny. I'd love but, to do that. Um, but again, these, you know, decisions are made so high up top that, you know, I just don't know. Mm. But it's so funny how, like, every time Danny is like, oh, I'm too old for this shit. It's like, his hair would get grayer and grayer and grayer. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's funny is I now show. understand that. You know, now, you know, at my age, having three kids and being married 20 years, I get it. Mm -hmm. What a perfect line to write. I'm too old for this shit, I'm just tired, you know? And he's out there fighting crime, you know, yeah. at that age. And so, um, so you know, it's aged another, like um, uh, most of Dick's films, it, it's aged so well. It's held up, it's, you know, it's, it's held up against the, the television series. It's just, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's been great, you know? But it would prove, pr prove to the world that he, no matter how old you are, you know, a lot of people are, you know, uh, what, Harrison Ford is almost 80. He's doing Indiana and Jones. Right. Stallone is going to do another. He's doing like two or three action movies. He's almost 80. Um, Liam Neeson's like 70 and he's still yeah. doing. They're, they're still in the man for action movies. So, right. you know, they're no matter how old Mel and Danny Glove, people, people would love to see him go at action again. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure they could do it. I'm sure they, you know, they're. You know, like I said, they're amazing talents, and you know, yeah. not only would they be able to do it, it would probably be like they haven't missed a beat. Oh yeah, fall right back in, like maybe yeah. maybe a little heavier, like you said. Maybe well, they both stay in the man way. But you know, stay in great shape. You know, yeah. if you give actors enough time, they'll look just like they did. You know, we all would. You know, yeah. give it enough time. So, yep. Yeah. Um, so for the finale, uh, let me ask you. Um, what will you remember most about uh, Richard Donner? That's a great way to close uh, yeah. the interview. I appreciate that question yeah. a lot. Um, his smile, um, his presence, 
his voice. You know, I think having lost my mom, that's the thing I miss the most is, you know, the voice. Mm-hmm. Um, but his voice, um, the great thing about his artistry is that it will, you know, survive. You know, it, it will be something that we can, you know, pick up and watch. Um, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was watching uh, his episode of The Twilight Zone with William Shatner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to me, it'll be, you know, his smile, his voice, his presence, um, more than anything, you know, and then just trying to, you know, move forward and live a life that, you know, is, is worthy of the blessing that I had, you know, having him in my life for however long it was. No. Great question. That's, that's a powerful answer. That's really good because yeah, he meant, he meant, he meant a lot to a lot of us, especially cinephiles and, you know, people who, you know, respect him. Right. So right. Well, rest in peace. There it is. Yeah. Big fella. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope you're, you're hanging out with Christopher. Right. The, the real Superman. Well, thank you guys for having me. I, I too am, uh, am, am honored that you would, you know, uh, reach out to me and uh, hopefully. Uh, well, we'd love, to, we'd love to have you on again, you know, talk about more about your career. I, absolutely. I'd love to. And uh, how are you doing at the, at the school and what are you teaching? Absolutely. So whenever you're ready, you can you can come back. Amazing. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Th- oh, wait. All right. Well, I want to thank Damien D. Hines for being a part of this wonderful tribute to Richard Donner. This has been Patrick and David and Damon for Mad Bros Media Zoom Show and Podcast. Have a good one.